Uh, this is Matt Britton, and we are back for, yes, our 21st edition of Susie's State of Consumer webinar. For those of you who are new to our State of the Consumer webinar, um, welcome. And for those of you who have been here for so long, I just want to thank you uh, for your continued support. It's getting nice out now um, here in Northeast, and hopefully everyone is taking the time to get outside, enjoy some fresh air, and hopefully we'll continue with this progress we've been seeing uh, with the vaccine distribution and get to some level of normalcy um, starting in the summer and, of course, into the fall. Most of our State of the Consumer webinars have been about the impact of the pandemic, um, and certainly there'll be some undertones to that today, but I, it's not lost on me that today we're not going to be talking so much about the pandemic and really talking about um, building brand love and brand loyalty. So, you know, to me, that's a positive side. Um, frankly, I'm kind of tired of using words like uh, crisis and new normal and pandemic um, and excited to use words like brand love. To me, it's a lot more positive. So um, hopefully today will be a positive um, session. And most importantly, we really have some amazing guests today. Um, that we're going to be joining. Um, Alexa D. Pasquale, uh, Nikki Mazel, and Kate Kim are going to be joining us in a little bit, all of which who have really unique perspectives on building brand loyalty um, based upon the brands that they've worked with throughout their careers. Uh, but first, I'm going to give a little bit of a presentation about what we've uncovered using our Suzy Consumer Insights tool um, about the notion of brand loyalty. Um, for those of you who don't know what Suzy is, Suzy is a real-time um, consumer research tool. Uh, we now work with over 250 leading enterprises across nearly every major consumer sector to really help them democratize the notion of market research across their enterprise. Um, our powerful tool allows um, business decision makers to instantly speak to the consumers that matter and give relevant statistically significant feedback to help them make decisions with confidence. And although we are coming out of a, a generational pandemic there are still so many unknowns in terms of how the consumer is going to be changed coming out of this. And now more than ever, you really need to have your finger on the pulse of the consumer. And that's exactly what Suzy does for you. So um, if you have any questions about Suzy, you can um, ask us after the fact um, or get in touch with one of our um, business development representatives, and we'll point you to them at the end of this presentation. Um, today, we are going to be reviewing a study this, um, that basically gives us our data that we're to present, presenting. It was conducted on March 22nd with a sample size of 1,000 uh, U.S. citizens. The sample is directionally representative of U.S. consumers working from home and census weighted across age, gender, ethnicity, and region from our own Suzy panel. So with that, let's get into loyalty. So loyalty, as you all know, is the holy grail of marketing. It's really what every brand looks for. Um, you know, the reason why, obviously, is from an economic model, once you've developed loyalty, your customer acquisition cost drops dramatically. Uh, the cost of retaining a loyal customer is far lower. And if you can actually turn that loyal customer into an advocate, um, into somebody who's going to evangelize your brand, then essentially you have your customer working for you. And the best brands in the world, the ones that really take off, are ones that can build that loyalty and advocacy into the product experience itself. Um, the best example of kind of product advocacy built in I can ever think of is when, back, dating myself now, but when the iPhone first came out and they had those really iconic um, white head, um, headphones that you plugged in um, and ear, earbuds, I should say. And I remember on the subway in New York City, back when everyone used to ride the subway in New York City, and just seeing first one or two people with the white um, earbuds in, and then 10 people, and then the whole subway wearing it. And it became so easy for you to kind of identify yourself as having an iPhone, which was a big deal back in 2008, 2009, because of those earphones. Um, they basically built advocacy into the product. Um, first, they had loyalty because they had a great product. And advocacy was kind of built in. And I'll never forget that. And I think it's those little things um, in marketing to make your product easy to spread that can make all the difference in the world. Um, but does loyalty still exist today? Uh, many believe that loyalty is waning just because consumers have more choice than ever before. You know, when you had to choose between Coke and Pepsi, right, or you had to choose between, um, you know, let's say Ford and General Motors um, for your vehicle because you had limited choices, um, you know, loyalty was a little bit easier to develop, but now there's a long tail of products for everyone. Um, it, the, the kind of the barrier to entry 
to get into most categories, maybe not automobiles, but in almost every other category, certainly the low involvement categories, whether you're selling, you know, yoga mats or beach balls um, or shampoo, there are endless choices. And what is kind of driving the success of a lot of sort of new entrants into a space is they will find a niche audience. Um, you look at Honest Company, which has grown to a multi-billion dollar company, and they zeroed in on sort of the wealthy millennial mom that really cared about kind of organic ingredients in the home um, and basically knew that they were willing to pay more for those products than some of the mass produced products out there. And they sort of built out that niche, a niche that might not have existed and Honest Company itself might have not had those opportunities maybe 10, 15 years ago. Um, it's easier to produce products now and it's easier to distribute products, which makes a notion of loyalty um, even harder to achieve. Um, also, you have companies that aren't just playing in niches on the macro level, but on the micro level. So it used to be that woman who would buy Maybelline would stick with Maybelline across all their products. But then Glossier comes out uh, with a specific um product or brand that has more efficacy, even if it's just in something like a mascara brush, all of a sudden, Glossier is working its way into the consumer set. So you can at first enter and have a very narrow entry point with maybe one product or one use case that gets yourself into the kitchen or gets yourself into the consumer's uh, bathroom cabinet. And once you do that, you can start to chip away at the incumbent. And we start to see that throughout so many different um, industries where all of a sudden, you know, um, somebody might sell sparkling water. I mean, the perfect example of Budweiser, right? Budweiser is a huge install base of obviously beer drinkers. They just did a deal with Travis Scott and now they're coming in with hard seltzer and they're going to use that hopefully to chip away at some incumbents in the hard seltzer space that have done so well over the last couple of years. So all it takes is sort of one niche to kind of get in. All of a sudden you can chip away um, at that loyalty. Um, but brand loyalty is high, especially in certain categories with the, with the brands that are doing it well, and we're going to really focus today on the brands that are doing it well. And of course, our esteemed panel uh, will dig into that a lot. Uh, McKinsey said that 75% um, percent of consumers have actually changed brands during the pandemic, uh, which I thought was really interesting. And of the top three reasons um, that A was value, they were looking for value. Obviously, when the pandemic a year ago first hit, there was talk of us entering a great depression and people were really concerned about their financial well-being. And all of a sudden, instead of them maybe getting a name brand laundry detergent, they were looking at, you know, private label. They were looking at the Costco private label brands um, because they were slightly cheaper and every dollar mattered. Um, now, in, in many consumers still feel that way, but we are definitely in a different overall macroeconomic uh, situation. Two, during the pandemic, one of the big issues was availability. Uh, many products were not available, especially if you're looking at something like, say, toilet paper. If you, um, you know, specifically bought Scott toilet paper, for example, there was a good chance that that popular toilet paper brand was gone when you went to uh, the supermarket or grocery store to actually pick it up. And because of that, maybe you got the brand that was available. And if you were happy with that brand, that kind of created a, an entry point for a new brand to come in can steal some of that loyalty. And then lastly, convenience. Uh, there were many categories where it wasn't convenient for you to buy that product the way that you normally bought it. Many consumers just shift it directly and, and almost exclusively to online shopping. And in that regard, if the user experience of, let's say an Instacart made it easier for you to buy a certain grocery product because it was in the flow of how you're shopping, well then convenience entered the fray and made it, made it easier for a new brand to come in. So definitely the pandemic lowered uh, the bar uh, for a lot of companies to come in and actually establish that loyalty. The big question is post pandemic, um, will they be able to retain that loyalty? Uh, another big driver in terms of brand loyalty right now um, is the notion of first party data. There are some massive changes going on um, in the digital advertising world that I think many people are underestimating. Uh, most importantly, you have companies like Google now saying that you're that they're going to be operating in essentially a cookieless world where you can no longer use people's activities on on other sites to kind of target people within the Google platform. Um, Apple is putting in a tremendous amount of new privacy um, policies in place as well, which essentially make it harder for you to advertise on their app store and on the apps. So as a result, as a result of all these changes and really the, the long-term death of the cookie because of you know growing privacy concerns, more and more brands 
understand that in order for them to have a good channel to communicate with consumers, the consumers that matter to them most, they need to be collecting first party data. First party data has now become the penultimate entry point for consumer loyalty. Now that might not seem like a surprise to you, but think about it. If you're a brand like Coca-Cola, for years, you really didn't have to care about first party data. All you really had to care about is getting more shelf space at Walmart, at Target, at Costco, right? If you had that shelf space, you had those couple extra inches or you had an end cap, you were going to be able to drive volume and you really didn't need to know who your consumer was as much, especially for a big brand like Coca-Cola, because they obviously can advertise on the Super Bowl or during, you know, primetime television to broader audiences. It's not like they were going after a niche. But now what the pandemic has brought on is the fact that many consumers are now buying grocery products, for example, um, really across the whole CPG category online. Um, they are, have, have learned that's easy. They're, they're obviously leaning into platforms like Amazon, like Instacart. And now all of a sudden, that shelf space has become virtual. And virtual shelf space doesn't operate the same way because there's limitless shelf space right um, on an Amazon. And because of that, these consumer packaged goods brands need to now speak to their end consumer and really have more of a bottoms up branding or loyalty based approach versus again, the top down and focusing on the retailers. And as a result, many brands are really focusing on different unique ways to capture first party data. And they're doing it obviously through sweepstakes and giveaways. But what you're starting to see now is many brands do it through content. Neutrogena uh, last week announced that they're creating Neutrogena Studios where they're gonna be creating their own content to go direct to consumers. So consumers have a reason to give up their data to interact with Neutrogena. Um, and you're going to start to see more and more brands doing that uh, moving forward. So what is loyalty? Is loyalty simply repeat purchases? Um, consumers are kind of all over the spectrum when it comes to sticking with the same products. Um, you know, it all depends upon the use case, uh, but about a third of consumers lean towards sticking to the same products, a third like trying towards something new, and a third really haven't thought of it when we asked our consumers that. Obviously, the category matters a lot. Uh, people are more likely to make repeat purchases on items that must be uh, replenished often. For example, I am a loyal Starbucks drinker because I have to purchase it every single morning. So to me, I don't want to every day think about where I'm going to get my coffee. That's the last decision I want to make. I just want to go to the same place every day. They know my name. I enter the same thing in the app every single day. And boom, it becomes very easy. Um, and I'm frankly, the same way with the lunch I order every day from Seamless, one of two different places every single day. People are really creatures of habit, especially for high frequency purchases like coffee, like lunch, like candy that you're picking up at, at a convenience store, um, or even makeup. 81% have purchased their favorite makeup two or more times. However, they're more likely to branch out when the purchase is more rare. So luxury goods, right? Um, you know, only half have purchased their favorite shoe, um, you know, actually less than half, uh, two or more times. Most consumers are, are when they're going to buy a luxury item, like a luxury high-end shoe, they're going to be switching it up a little bit. And auto is the ultimate example of this, um, where um, many consumers will branch out because it's more of a rare purchase. It's something that they're only doing every four years. And because of it, they can take the time. Um, the longer the purchase cycle is, the less likely co consumers are going to become loyal. So loyalty really shrinks with purchase cycle. Obviously, uh, candy or coffee is something that you're buying every day. And because it's a short purchase cycle, you're much more likely to buy the same product over and over again. But when you're talking about a house, when you're talking about a luxury purchase, those are things where it's much harder to retain that loyalty. Um, and that's why traditionally automakers have um, been spending the most amount every year on advertising because they have to compensate for that lack of loyalty. Um, by essentially over and over again building brand. One thing as a, as a longtime um, lessee of cars is I think that most luxury um, automakers can do a much better job at driving customer loyalty. They kind of divorce themselves from the notion of customer service and when you service your vehicle, and then they only come back into the fray at the very end, where I would think that if I were running you know, Lexus or a BMW, I would invest in a white glove service to make sure that I am investing in that loyalty with my existing customers over and over again, because like in any business, it's a lot less expensive to keep your 
your existing customers and to go out and get new ones. Um, product performance is obviously a huge driver in loyalty. <clears throat> um, but basically, I think the big misconception is that many brands think that um, you know following a brand on social media means they're loyal. Um, when we ask consumers, um, you know, many said they're least likely to display, um, you know, the loyalty by following a brand on social media. I don't think brands equate loyalty and a, a consumers equate loyalty and following a brand on social media with nearly the same importance as brands think it means. I think consumers will follow a brand on social media probably for their own selfish purposes rather than sort of a, a display of, um, of loyalty. Um, we ask people to think of all your favorite products that you um, listen, how the products make you feel when you're going to be loyal. And we got some interesting things back, uh, mostly products I like uh, make me feel understood by a brand. It makes me feel like the brand has people like me in mind. And that's why when you go back to something like Honest Company that kind of built their brand on an insight um, of the millennial mom who cares about the ingredients that she brings into her home for her family, you know, they've done a great job at making consumers feel understood. Red Bull has done an incredible job at that. Over time, owning one category, extreme, going after first Gen X and then Gen Y males around extreme sports. Everything they did was based upon that. They were very careful on what they did do and what they didn't. You would never see Red Bull advertised during an NBA game, right? And even though the NBA had that, you know, that 18 to 34 male audience had the eyeballs, but for them... It wasn't extreme sports. So in building a brand and building loyalty, it's as much about what you do than as it is about what you don't do. Um, and, you know, really showing the consumer that you understand them. Obviously, research is hugely important. Um, consumers now are more savvy than ever before. Obviously, the longer the sales cycle, the less the loyalty and also the more chance that they're going to be doing <clears throat> a significant amount of, of consumer research. Um, consumers, nearly a third said they're extremely likely to be doing research before a product. And the research is really going to be sort of multifaceted. Um, they're going to be looking at kind of traditional publisher reviews, but then they're going to be looking at bloggers. They're going to be searching on Twitter. Really, you know, the, the, your consumer loyalty is going to manifest in the new consumer, consumer journey. The more people that, that love your brand, the easier is it going to be for you to get new consumers, even if those existing customers aren't evangelizing you, because they're going to be seeking out the opinion of other people who have your product. <clears throat> and that's exactly why a brand like Peloton has been so successful during the pandemic is they have a 94 MPS score, which is essentially off the charts. So everybody who has gotten a Peloton has loved it. And because of that, when consumers are going down the consumer purchasing journey and they're going through reviews because it is a um, you know high value purchase, all they're going to hear along the way is positive reviews. That loyalty has been gained by consumers through product performance, and it's made it much easier for Peloton to kind of stick out and be that kind of winning at-home fitness brand uh, during the pandemic. Um, meaningful brands that are viewed as making the world a better place. It's interesting, outperform the stock market by 134%. And you're seeing that happen. I wouldn't say you're seeing that happen in the last couple of weeks, but you know, you look at um going in the social media space, you look at platforms like Pinterest and Snapchat. Those brands over the last year have outperformed. Facebook, because what Pinterest and Snapchat are seen as, and even most importantly, look at something like TikTok. Um, they are, TikTok is seen as really a safe place. It's not really a place that's incendiary, that's full of hate. It's really more full of creativity, where if you go on a platform like Twitter um, or Facebook, especially in the year 2020, you saw a lot of divisiveness, um, a lot of hate, a lot of um, you know uh, people that were either virtual signaling or people who were going after one another. And it's no surprise that brands like TikTok and Pinterest really outperformed um, platforms like Facebook and Twitter during 2020 because consumers were seeking something that they felt like made the world a better place. And now I think you're starting to see a lot of the, the core platforms I mentioned kind of try to clean up their act if they can. 60% um, of Americans would now uh, buy or boycott a brand based upon how it responds to protests and Black Lives Matter. And we're seeing that 2020 taught us that brands can no longer sit on the sidelines when it comes to social issues. And I actually think that comes to loyalty of your consumer, but also loyalty of your employees. I think uh, companies that have a big millennial and Gen Y employee base, those employees expect companies to stand up for something. 
And if those employees are going to be uh, loyal to that organization, they need to know that that organization has a heart to it. And they're going to basically be a company that is um, cause oriented and not just about the bottom line. Uh, we know that consumers are more likely to be loyal uh, because of product price and performance. 62% again say product performance makes them loyal. 42% said pricing makes them loyal. So pricing obviously does matter. Again, I think that's going to be based on a category uh, by uh, category basis. Uh, consumers might be more likely to select items also because they are polarizing, because they make a bigger statement. So you look at like my pillow, which obviously is a, associated with the far right, and you look at the popularity during the election cycle of my pillow. It became sort of a brand that far right, um, you know, Republicans saw as sort of like an identifier. It was sort of like a brand emblem. The same way where you'll see, you know, a um, a Prius. Uh, that people will drive is a way for them to signal that they care about the environment or a brand like Supreme, which for so long um, really signaled um, to the, the younger generation that somebody was kind of into art, into culture, et cetera. And in some ways, the more polarizing a brand, the more loyal consumers are because they feel like it more speaks to their tribe, who they're connected with, et cetera. Um, when consumers are loyal, obviously it pays off. Loyal consumers become, as I mentioned earlier, um, huge advocates. Um, so loyalty is, isn't dead at all. And I'm really excited now to bring in um, our panel. But loyalty is definitely different. Again, <clears throat> the longer the purchase cycle, the less loyalty. We've seen that play out in so many different categories. Um, loyalty is love, but it's not unconditional. Uh, consumers are obviously Googling your brand. What the internet says matters. And that's kind of like loyalty coming up to the surface. And brand loyalty is really about identity. Um, and even if people say they buy for price and performance, the brand matters. What the brand represents matter, matters. And what you adorning the brand showcases to other people uh, matters as well. So um, I'm really excited now um, and bring on our panel. So let's bring in our panel, if you guys don't mind joining in. Um, so here we go. Wow. This is just incredible, the power of the internet. Uh, Nikki, I think you were still on mute. Yep. Perfect. Hi, everyone. Hi. Thank Hi. you so much for joining. Um, I wanted to get through my presentation uh, quickly because I know that your thoughts are going to be way more interesting. So um, I want to dive in. And why don't we start with Alexa? Why don't you give a quick introduction about who you are, who you work for? And um, we'll go from there. Absolutely. Hey, uh, I'm Alexa. I'm the Director of Innovation Marketing at Daily Harvest, which is a direct-to-consumer food company. Um, and I am specifically responsible for the strategy and execution of all of our food innovation and launches. I love Dairy Harvest. I love this I'm movie. so glad. <laughs> I'm, I'm a loyal customer of them. Thank um, you. Sometimes yeah. just the food, just like if, I, if I'm away, it just kind of like stocks up and takes up my entire refrigerator. So that's the one thing I just got to have to figure out is how do I modulate how much I order. But besides that, I'm a huge fan and I've been for quite some time. Uh, Nikki, tell us about yourself. Uh, Nikki Maisel. I'm an EVP account leader at McCann. I've been working in the ad land for 20 years at agencies, all shapes and sizes, industries, including telecom, consumer electronics, CPG, casual dining, Home security, gaming—you kind of name it, all except cars. Although I love cars, so. What's the favorite brand you've ever worked on? Oh man, so funny because I don't. Well, I'd have, I'd have to say Canon. Okay. Give it to Canon. We just did incredible work, and it was all about empowering creativity, and I, I love that brand. Yeah, very cool. Kate, thanks for joining. Tell thanks us about for yourself. having me. Um, I'm Kate Kim. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Remedy. Prior to Remedy, I was actually working on big blue chip companies like Dove and Axe and Cadillac. Um, and afterwards, I was working at the intersection of retail and technology, working at a brand incubator um, to create brands and products from scratch and marketing and launching them. Very cool. So I'd love to hear from you guys and, and just shout out in terms of what's the, what's the, your, the brand that you're most loyal to? If, if you had it, mine would be Starbucks. It's just by habit, but I'd love to know what brand you believe you're most loyal to and why. Alexa, you go first. I'll, I'll jump in. I mean, 
of course I'll say daily harvest because right. but no, if it without that, funny enough, actually V, which is a uh, face wash and moisturizer, I have been using it for probably two decades now. Um, and speaking to kind of what you said, Matt, about performance, it's just that it works extremely well, it's affordable, and it's something that I know I can rely on. So I've gone back time and time again and tell all of my friends. <laughs> so what would it take for you to not be loyal to that brand and use a competitive product? Or are you locked like it's met your needs and you're good i'm 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 kind of locked i mean you know as someone who i struggled with with uh acne as a kid and so i think when you go through that as a consumer mindset of like how do i solve that challenge and that problem when you finally find a brand that has a product line that does that it's it's sort of difficult to deviate so right. unless my need state changes exactly I would then maybe switch over and do you find yourself proactively advocating for that brand like all the time right. <laughs> here so you, go. you go doing it right now <laughs> there you go so that so i mean we, it, was, it really covers a point we talked about in terms of performance turned into loyalty which turned to advocacy the product worked for you you became loyal and now you're an advocate and now you know and do you feel like they do you think the brand knows that you're loyal like are you part no. of Right. No, which is definitely part of the problem. Um, and it is funny. Uh, and I can see th some things bubbling up in the chat. Um, Sarah V happens to be having a little bit of a moment right now on TikTok. And it's like a very community cult favorite type of thing that's happening. But I became part of that cult far before those social media platforms. You're an OG. <laughs> Uh, right, exactly. And the only way they would have been able to know it is tracking my CVS loyalty card that that was what I was buying, right? Because I get it at Unless CVS. they made you some type of offer and, and made you part of a crew where you could have discounts and, you know, all sorts of different things. They held special dinners in New York City. You know, there's a lot they could have been doing. They just, 100%. 100%. Right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, so, Nikki, what brand are you most loyal to? You know what's really interesting? Up until about a year ago, I'd probably say Nike, but Peloton definitely is my number one now. It's been right. life changing for me in the pandemic. The home content I felt was so well done, how quickly they pivoted and that they embraced the imperfection of the sound and the quality of the video because it was more important that the community stayed together and we went through something together. Right. And I think as we are in this world of hyper transparency, brands kind of embracing a little bit of imperfectness, you know, and I'm saying this as a brand lead at an agency where we're like type A crazy people, yep. a little bit of imperfection to be part of the community and, and take those barriers down, I think is really powerful. Um, yeah. So they're my number one now. I think with Peloton, their challenge is going to be, you know, you talk about stay at home companies and like, they're the only company really that you can only use at home right now. Like the product is 150 pounds, it doesn't move. So in a world where, you know, you see, I saw yesterday, you know, Las Vegas is now brimming and, and now you have Disney World and people wanna get out. They almost wanna right. do everything but stay home. How are they as a fitness brand gonna be able to manage that? And how is the consumer perceptions and behaviors gonna change about in-home fitness? That's, that's a loyalty question, but more something if I was running Peloton, you know, I would definitely want to diversify, figure out how I can get the content. How do I take that brand love to having someone like yourself and try to monetize it in other ways so they don't have all their eggs in sort of one basket, so to speak. Right. I think they're well prepared with their on-demand content. I have friends right. that don't have a bike, but use the use the app for workouts, yeah. for, for runs. So that's better is the entry there, right? Yeah, because any, because exactly. like anyone can exactly. jump on YouTube and do that. So that's going to be totally. sort of their challenge, you know? Totally. Um, but yeah, it's really interesting. Kate, how about you? Yeah, for me, it's a tech product called Every Mother, which is a perinatal mm -hmm. like fitness and physical therapy app. And I think that especially in the last year where you couldn't go to a physical therapy office um, or a pelvic floor specialist, being able to take care of your body from the comforts of your own home has been really, really important. It's an app that I use on a daily basis every multiple times a day. And I think that, you know, talk about utility. It's actually, I, I can see the results that it has. And, and Kate, you built your own brand remedy right from the ground up. So like, I have, so like you obviously, so tell us about that and tell us what you've done to build loyalty. We're talking about all of these brands and here you are who built your own. So tell us, you know, what's worked. Yeah, absolutely. For us, we, to give you guys a little bit of information about what Remedy does, yeah, we're a holistic digestive wellness company and our Visha product is a chewable that you can think about it as a multivitamin for your gut and your digestive system. Um, we've identified the most common outages that people have when it comes to digestion and created a supplement that addresses 
uh, 90 percent of those issues. I think that when we launched this product, we knew what the pain points that we were serving were. So we actually found really passionate groups of micro influencers that have been talking about IBS, bloating, digestive issues. And we built an authentic relationship with them. We reached out to them, told them the Genesis story of Remedy and sent them some product with zero expectations or obligations. And we were shocked to see the flooding of user generated content, the testimonials that they were broadcasting. And it had a snowball effect because people could believe a not sponsored or a not an ad post. Right. And so how do you think now? So it sounds like you started by going after these micro influencers, you have now a little base. What are some of the things you're doing so you can turn your consumers into, um, you know, like how Nikki feels about Peloton, right? How are you going to make those consumers shout from the hilltops? Or do you feel like they already are? Yeah, I mean, it's something that we're always trying to find ways to empower our customers to talk more about our brand, especially when we play in an unpretty category or cringeworthy category as, you know, such as such as GI. I think branding, as you mentioned, is really important, making it, you know, a product that's not called gas X or comes in blister packs, but something that feels more like a lifestyle brand. Um, I think that aesthetic is really important. Right. The same thing. Yep. Yeah, I get exactly. it. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. And I think that's, you know, that's one. And then second, I think it's the utility factor. I think the pro- the fact that this product works and actually moves a needle gives people the confidence that they want to share it out with someone because they they hope that it also helps them. Right. So, I mean, I'll open up to the group. What are some other good tactics that you've seen other brands do? Because, you, you know, essentially what I'm hearing is, you guys love the brands you mentioned because they perform for you, they deliver, right? And because of that, that's all it takes. But, you know, in talking to you, Alexa, it sounds like, you know, the brand you love could be doing more, um, and sort of, you know, recognizing you as a loyal influencer for the brand and a powerful influencer of their brand. So, um, you know, what are some things that brands could be doing that you're not seeing enough of right now? Absolutely. Um, So I think one thing is experiences. You kind of touched on this a little bit. And now given, of course, you know, the COVID times, um, brands haven't had the same ability to create environment and community without a digital factor. But as we start to move into post pandemic world and a little bit of normalcy, the opportunity to bring people together around your brand and create experiences that are memorable um, is really important. And I think also, Uh, What we've seen in particular with Daily Harvest is people are believers right when they try it. Right when you are able to try the food, they're like, wow, I did not realize that fruits and vegetables could taste this delicious. It's so easy. Right. And it's so easy. So what we're really excited to be able to do is actually come out and start to get our food in the hands of people from a trial perspective and be able to create an experience where those customers are walking away saying, not only did I love that food, but I loved that moment that I got to share with the brand. Um, I think so experiences are one. The other is customer service. So at Daily Harvest, we call our team the care team because we take care of food and we're very intentional and diligent about how we handle our customers, but the relationship that you develop with your customers, even from your service perspective, is crucial. Um, I am sure all of us have had the experience where uh, it's it's actually just happened recently. I had to physically pick up the phone to cancel a membership rather than being able to use any kind of chatbot or, you know, email someone or whatever it is. The the barrier to entry for me to be loyal to that brand is so high when it's not convenient for me to make it fit my life. So getting, getting uh, a millennial to pick up the phone is the equivalent yeah, of yeah. your grandparents walking to school right. barefoot over a rock. Yeah, right? Exactly. <laughs> right. Um, and it's important, right? Because that that's you, you have to, as a brand, you need to be able to define who your customer is, who is the target audience, and what are the needs that they need solved. And, you know, ease of, of whether it's your return process, whether it's the way in which you're able to handle an issue um, or get an answer to something, you need to be able to do that in such a way that fits that that customer's life. Absolutely. Um, and I think with Daily Harvest, it's interesting because, you know, you guys probably benefited by the fact that people couldn't go to restaurants and they could eat more at home. But now you'll probably benefit equally by 
just because I think now what people had during the pandemic is more time than ever before, right? Because they weren't basically go, doing adventure. They weren't going even to work, right? So they had way more time than ever before, but they were that was coming at the exchange or in, um, instead of adventure, serendipity, et cetera. Now they're about to have far less time because they're going to be hitting the road. They're going to be going to work, et cetera. And I look at Dairy Harvest as a time saver as well. You don't oh, have major. to. Be, so I think that you guys kind of win both ways, which is an yes. interesting um, in terms of how you're positioned. Um, but that's interesting. So you talk, she talked about a community. Um, do you guys think, and I'll turn to you, Nikki, that the community, if you were a brand and you advise a lot of the biggest brands in the world, right, about building community, I'm sure, would you have that community live on Facebook? Would you create, because A, you have the convenience, right? You have the social graph, but it's on Facebook, right? Or would you create something net new? And have you tried either? And what are your thoughts on that? Um, you know, it's really interesting. We tried to create a community, um, you know, in a separate platform when working on Canon. And of it's course- hard. It's really hard. First of all, you need to be a brand. You need to know where your consumers are, right? So the mistake that I think we made in the past, and I'm going back now, you know, five, 10 years ago. So I think we were, you know, Canon's a community led brand, right? You know, it's a badge of honor, whether you're Canon or Nikon. When these things took over, you know, it was really important to make sure that we fostered that community. Yeah. I think the mistake that was made was trying to then bring that community into our own platform, right? We There was a lot of time and effort and investment spent, Alexa remembers this, um, on building that community in a different platform rather than going where they were. Rather right. than going, you know what? They're all on Flickr. Let's talk to Flickr about right. building a community, you know, partnering with them. I think that's where interesting collaborations and partnerships really need to be considered because you need to go where consumers are. You know, similar with Pringles, one of my favorite brands I ever worked on. They have an entire, I mean, what they're doing in social media the last 18 months, and this is a little bit past my time, so kudos to my old team. Um, but it, it's incredible the way that they've like used the pandemic and Pringles being this comfort food, sales are, you know, incredible. Um, they've had so much fun in social. They know exactly who they are as a brand. They're a brand that's all about fun in a time when we need it most. Um, they've really grown that community, but they've gone where the users are. So I think yeah. it's really important not to try to force a behavior, but to lean and on. And I think the last thing we need is another username and password to remember, right? <laughs> and I think that we see that in market research where some of the brands we work with say, oh, we're building our own research community. And what I always tell them is, A, is an echo chamber. You're going to be speaking to the same people over and over again. And B, your consumer isn't going to want to have one community for the car they own and one community for yeah. you know the hotel they stay at. Like, that's not how consumers work. As I mentioned earlier, they're about to be more stretched for time than ever before. And I think it's a big thing for us all to remember is we keep hearing from everyone, oh, it's going to be like the roaring 20s again. Um, and consumers are going to be traveling like ever before. Like, I agree. You know, Disney World's going to be full and, and people are going to be going to see their family and everyone's going to be outdoors and restaurants are going to be full. I agree with all that. But what I never hear about is at the expense of what? Because there's still only 24 hours in a day. Consumers still only have so much money to spend. So what are they going to be doing more of um, you know, or well, I'll say more, uh, more of in 2021, I think we all know, what are they going to be doing less of? So like I was just watching yeah. um, on CNBC talking about like Netflix and how there's so many streaming services, for example. Right. I have a hard time believing that, you know, streaming television isn't going to go down if people aren't home. But no one ever talks about that. So mm -hmm. I think it's interesting just to, which is a thought. It's like, what are they going to be doing less of? Some it's people really think it's awesome, you know? Yeah. It's a great question for Home Depot, actually. Who's right. survived in this doer? I culture. think they win no matter what. Yeah, they will. But you've, I mean, less time at home, right? I mean, how do Maybe, you. Maybe because yeah. now what I think you've seen with the housing boom is that consumers, while, you know, we're planning on opening up an office, but it will definitely be hybrid. I right. think right. what consumer, you know, you have a Peloton, I have a Peloton. Like, people want to now work out at home. They know that their kids may be working from home, uh, from school, not always, but maybe from time to time more, and mm -hmm. certainly work. So right. the home has become way more important. And right. if you look mm -hmm. at the, the kind of hours in the day that you're going to be spending at home post pandemic than pre pandemic, mm -hmm. um, it's going to be way higher. And that's mm -hmm. why you're seeing suburban home prices go up and et cetera, et cetera. So I'm long Home Depot just because I think that 
consumers really will now put much more money there personally. Yeah. Um, and I think companies should subsidize. Um, if consumers are going to be working from home, companies should help. And that's something that we're thinking about um, at Suzy. Um, so Kate, we talked about sort of like communities. We talked about where it should be built. Um, you run a brand. It's I can't imagine, you know, the things that you have to think through every day from manufacturing to FDA to all these things. And now you have to think about loyalty. But on the topic of loyalty, like what are some things that you're thinking about doing with your loyal customers, whether it's discounts, free stuff, dinner with you, like what, what, what types of things can you do to drive that loyalty? Yeah, absolutely. We have a really tight feedback loop with our customers. So yep. 15 days into their service, they get an email directly from me asking about, you know, do you have any questions? What's your feedback? Do you like this? Do you not like this? And then the follow-up question is, are you willing to get on a five minute phone call with me and just finish? And that has actually been incredibly important as we optimize, as we garner learnings. And that's been one of the unique advantages of having a direct to consumer brand is that, as you were saying, first party data, having access to our customers and meeting them where they are, you know, taking it beyond email and texting them. We are investing heavily into text based content, education, commerce, as well as customer service. And, you know, we also have to stay agile and nimble so that we continually push ourselves to meet customers where they are. They're not going to come to our platform. It's not going to do us any good to host a remedy, uh, remedy community on our site, but maybe it's a secret Facebook group. Right. And how are you thinking about distribution? Are you all direct to consumer right now? Actually, we have moved to Amazon as well as um, we have a pilot coming up with CVS at the end of the summer. And That's I think amazing. that as we continue wow. to move, thank you, as we continue to move into a more omni-channel distribution, it has its pros and cons. Like, how do we think about when we sell uh, to a customer on Amazon, how do we think about getting them to come back? I mean, when you sell on a platform like Amazon or when you sell no a third-party retailer, they're not really your customers anymore. They're yep. Target's customers or Amazon's customers. So we're unlike, continually Unlike noodling. Shopify, which is kind of like the anti-Amazon, which allows you to build your own platform, but you don't have then that distribution to their hundreds of millions of shoppers. And that's the trade-off, right? So Exactly. But when we talk about continually pushing ourselves to be more of service to our customers, that's part of that equation is we have to be available where it's more convenient for them to purchase. I mean, we started selling on Amazon three weeks ago, and it's already matching or surpassing our direct to consumer sales. And that's really powerful. That's a strong signal from our customers saying, hey, I've seen your ads on social media, maybe I've purchased, maybe I've not. But the fact that you're on Amazon is hugely valuable to me. Yeah, it's really interesting. I did the whole e-commerce webinar a couple of weeks ago and, you know, it's it's really kind of like you, it's, it's, I don't want to say you're doing business with the devil because Amazon, I think is a great company, <laughs> employs more people than anybody else in America and, you know, raise the minimum wage to $15. And I think for all the flack Jeff Bezos got, and I actually think that Amazon's done well, uh, but at the same time, you do lose that control. You don't mm -hmm. have customer data. You know, I, I think of brands like Warby Parker, where they were never on Amazon um, and they're allowed, to, it enables them to give these sort of very robust digital experiences like digital try-ons. And of course, mm -hmm. they've been successful with their, you know, their physical retail, right? You look at Nike, mm -hmm. Nike made the decision to pull out of Amazon because now they're one of the most iconic lifestyle brands in the world. And um, one of Nike's favorites, not not one anymore, um, but you know, they decided to come off of Amazon to go direct um, and their stocks exploded since because mm -hmm. they want to be able to control the environment. They want to be able to have those immersive experiences. They want that first party data and they feel like just being thrown in with a bunch of other brands doesn't work for them. And I think for mm -hmm. almost every company now, the Amazon and Shopify route, Shopify meaning you create your own store, you don't get their yeah. audience, but you get the data. That is going to be one of the biggest decisions so many companies are making as e-commerce accelerates, because I think the biggest misconception people have is that when the pandemic is over, that e-commerce is going to not accelerate anymore, where mm -hmm. in a world where the, you have less time, people are going to buy online more, not less coming out of it. Uh, so that's just yeah. a thought. So anybody else have thoughts on Amazon versus um, kind of the Shopify model? And if you were, you know, running a new brand, where would you go? Nikki, Alexa, thoughts? I mean, I would just say that I think like, particularly in the food category, the fragmentation of at least my now experience of I've joined Thrive, we have Daily Harvest, you know, I think the way you can get people to your platform and, and bring them to your own experience is 
by creating a, you know, surprise and delight or a reason to be there. Right. So I love with thrive that I'm saving a specific amount of money. I know how expensive all that, all those organic snacks are for my kids, but you know, I stock them. I think in the world of the pandemic of like stocking, like we're Costco, I don't think that's going to go away because we just saw what happened with the floods in Texas. Like we're, Oh, you know, I think everyone's always going to have a little extra. Um, You're right. There's this fragmentation of, uh, I'm going to get that from there and that from there. No one really cares about all the boxes coming anymore because it's kind of easy. You know, it's yeah. It, it'll be really interesting to see how it all plays out. But I think if there's a surprise and delight in something in it for the consumer, then you're more likely to bring them to you. Well, it also gives you pricing power. I mean, I think, you know, what a brand is ultimately the reason that um, Supreme was able to charge $200 for their T-shirts at one point is the brand had pricing power, you know, and I think. Uh, that's essentially what a brand gets you. It, it gets you the ability to do that. And once you're, and then you go to the race to the bottom and it's private label and some consumers in low involvement categories might be okay buying Kirkland paper towels from Costco because they don't really care and they don't, you know, the difference doesn't matter. So I think if you want to protect the brand, it comes at a cost. Sometimes it comes at a cost of not being on Amazon. We've seen War- Warby Parker be able to do it. We see Nike uh, be able to do it. And I think that's really going to be the question. Let's talk for a second about television and just media in general because you know nikki i know that you know you guys have created a ton of tv spots um in your life and i know lexi you've been part of campaigns um on the tv front kate i don't know if you're planning on doing a super bowl spot next year but maybe you will but (laughs) what do you guys think about what do you ladies think about um television and its power now just traditional linear television advertising Um, We we actually, funny enough, just started running our kind of first uh, TV ads over the last year or so. They've been extremely, extremely powerful and helpful for us. What I would say is, first off, how do you know? But we were able to measure it and we're able to see the traffic that is driven to our website from, you know, intriguing prospects and then ultimately the conversion that comes in. Um, What I will say is the definition of television has really started to shift and the brands that are recognizing that pre-roll ads and other placements of media from OTT are just as powerful, if not more, and frankly, generate better ROI, um, you know, that's places where it's starting to get really interesting. Um, And it's extremely helpful from an awareness perspective without question. I think it's just a matter of like, what are the goals of what you're trying to do? Is it just solely eyeballs? Are you trying to generate that one-to-one connection? Um, Because if you're talking about loyalty, television is not where you're driving loyalty. Television is where you're driving eyeballs to get them into the funnel to ultimately create the loyalty. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly right. And I think tempo moments also. I mean, I think there are certain moments where um, a, there's a live TV moment and your brand can have a major, you know, trajectory change. Super in- Bowl, Golden yeah, Globes, Super Bowl, right. Oscars, the Oscars, you know. Yeah, the, the, that, that, that's it. Like, there's not many. I mean, and even like the, 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 the ratings of the, of the Oscar awards are the lowest they've ever been. So mm-hmm. I think with the fragmentation, there aren't as many live um, moments. I think NFL is one of them, but right. But you never do a TV ad, just a TV ad, right? There's a whole program yeah. around it. There's social. There's it's in the headlines the next day. I mean, it's it's the TV ad is just the beginning of a story that you're talking about. Yeah. Program, right. Yeah. Um, for Oscars, for any of it, if you're doing it mm-hmm. right, it should never just be the 30 right. seconds when you're Absolutely. done. Um, it lives on. It's in YouTube. It's you know, it, it Pringles is a great example of that. I mean, yeah. they they do that program and it and it takes them through the whole year. Yeah, um, and that's a great brand. That what yeah. they've done with the law involvement category has been tremendous. Old Spice is one that you know PNG brands they've, they they know how to do it right. Yeah. So um, Pring, is Pringles still part of PNG or did, I thought they got divested? Frogs. Right, but they used to be PNG. I know that. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. Um, so let's talk about, and then we're gonna open up for questions. You know, influencers. Uh, they're obviously, in my opinion, can be so. It's really you, it's hit or miss, but when it's hit, it's huge. Um, and I think that they are so important in the lives, especially of millennial women, in my opinion. Um, you know, you'll let me know if it, that's spot on. But in terms of people spending their times on their phones in the news feed, looking at influencers when it comes to fashion and beauty, home care, even in the in the um, baby and parenting space, I think that influencers are so incredibly powerful at driving awareness because people really you know, follow these people and feel like they know them. And it's so much more rich when you see them 
recommend the product than just in an ad. I mean, Kate, what are your thoughts on that? And how would you plan on scaling influencers moving ahead? Yeah, absolutely. I, it's something that we approach very delicately and carefully because I yeah, think we, to. especially as a supplement company, we tread the line between authenticity and believability and just an ad, right? Like if you see Kylie Jenner promoting a anti-bloating tea, like, are you likely to believe that she actually uses it? Right. No, but it does make you know that there is an anti-bloating tea out there. So I think that that's, too. They, yeah, they, so you know, when Kylie posts, it moves product. I've seen it firsthand. <laughs> totally, totally. So I think that, you know, it's it's a line we tread carefully. But I think that when we think about influencers, we're also thinking about normalizing a behavior. So this is a product that doesn't really exist. Remedy is a product that doesn't really exist out there. Like, how do we talk about, you know, doing something good for your digestive system, which isn't something that people have been really thinking about? How do we get them to take something right before they eat or right after they eat? That's a chewable, you know, these are new behaviors that we're trying to educate to customers. And I think that, um, you know, we would love to scale our influencer effort even further, but it's constantly doing the calculation of, well, what's the ROI, you know, as a cash strap, startup, we're always thinking about what's the customer acquisition cost and can we attribute something directly to this one initiative? And we Absolutely. can't, it's hard to, you know, it's hard to make a big investment in that right now at the stage of our business. Yeah. And, and I get that in terms of, and we'll can turn over to Abel in a second, but you know, I'm running a startup myself. It's, you have the performance spend where you can directly attribute it. And then you have brand and we all know brand is so important. But brand is kind of like a sit up, right? If you do a hundred sit ups once, you're not going to jump on the scale and say, "Oh my god, I lost all this weight." You have to do it every single day, over and over and over again. And finally, one day when you least expect, you're like, "Wow!" Someone's like, "You look good." That's branding. Branding is exercise. Yeah, branding is the long game for sure. Yeah, and and I think in this world with VCs and investors and quick wins and companies worth billions of dollars after a year, a lot of people are missing that art. And I think ultimately, brands even in small communities, even in B2B, they, they win. And, you know, we definitely invest a lot in brands as well. Abel, great to see you. Um, for those of you who don't know Abel, uh, Abel, you have some experience with some of our steam panel, don't you? Tell us about that. <laughs> yeah, so I, I was lucky enough to work with actually all these lovely ladies Wow. Uh, when I was working at Grace. So actually Nikki hired me directly out of college. So Matt, you can thank her uh, for, for me being here today. Um, but uh, anyway, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you guys, we have a ton of questions that are coming from our audience. Um, and the first one really is centered around Instagram. So uh, I know Remini, you have about 32,000 and then Daily Harvest, you guys have about 570,000 Instagram followers. Um, so I'm just kind of curious from both your perspectives, um, how has Instagram really played a role in kind of driving brand loyalty, especially for some of those smaller niche um, communities? Um, so maybe Kate, I can throw that over to you first. Yeah, I mean, Digestive issues is an unpretty category. A lot of people feel ashamed or have historically felt ashamed doing anything about it. And certainly when they do something about it, it's in secret. Um, I think having an experience, a product experience and look and feel that makes people feel proud to share something has been really important, especially for Instagram, where it is a highly visual platform, seeing photos, seeing, you know, beautiful foodscape shot, tablescape shots with food and the food uh, and the remedy that they're pairing with, I think has been really powerful for us. And I think that it's a really easy get and really easy, um, partnerships that we can cultivate with not only health and wellness influencers, but with also uh, influencers in the nutrition space in the food scene. Um, so it's been it's been a powerful, not only community building tool, but also like a billboard advertisements and, and just eye catching visual material. Yeah, this, the same is for us. It's definitely a repository of sort of everything that we're launching, everything that we stand for, why certain ingredients are good for you. But I think the one thing, you know, that our Instagram in particular, and not even just Instagram, but social in general, is it's a surface where we really push our co-creation um, way of working. So we really do like pull the community to help us understand what smoothie do you want to see next? What flatbread do you want to see next? What flavor profiles are, are, you, are you loving? What are things that, you know, you wish were healthier for you and how can we do that for you so we really get involved with our customers and not only listen to them but work with them to co-create you know our future innovations which is really important and I think going back to how you build that loyalty that's a huge way that that's done because customers feel like they are part of the process and ultimately part of your brand yeah we were on with Sofia Hernandez from TikTok um she runs their business group and she said the same she said a brand can't go on TikTok 
successfully unless they work with one of the creators. It's just not authentic. The, the audience will see right through it. Yep. Definitely. Um, and we kind of touched on this next question, but maybe this is one uh, for you, Nikki, but a lot of people have obviously made shifts to kind of products, um, either because of a lack of product availability or something like that. Uh, but do you think that once we go back to a, a kind of a, a new world um, and people are kind of going out and about, do you think people are going to shift back to, to the products and experiences that they were doing pre-pandemic? I think it's going to be a little bit of a mixed bag, to be honest. I think, um, you know, people that found new ways of shopping and have way more convenience than ever. I don't think we're going to be rushing back to the grocery store. To be, honest. I mean, I think it's, it's certain things you've gained that time back. And no matter what, you'll find more useful ways of, of you know, using that time. Um, will I be on United Airlines again way more than I ever was before, you know, like, but, you know, will I go back to them? I, you know, I have my miles there, but to be honest, I mean, the way Delta handled the pandemic kind of makes me feel like I should, you know, switch over, you know, Why? what did like, Delta do? I, I feel like they didn't, um, they didn't sell out as much as some of the other airlines, oh, you so know, it was positive. like they had a, in a positive way. No, no, right. no. In a positive way that they. Okay. I, I continually heard from friends that did have to travel. They were keeping the middle seat open and that United planes were packed and little decisions like that, that brands made people over profit in the very beginning of the pandemic, I think are going to pay off um, tenfold as we come out of this. So yeah. um, I think it's going to be a mixed bag. I don't think there's one straight answer to that, Abel, although I wish there was. <laughs> I mean, I think that's a really interesting question there. Like for, for maybe Alexa and Kate, are there any other brands that you've seen do really strong kind of reactions to COVID that now make you more loyal um, to, to them as brands and maybe in a post pandemic world? Yeah, not to toot our own horn, but um, one thing that I am proud of <laughs> is when we, when COVID first hit and we were still, we're, we were starting to see the tens of millions of job losses, we were seeing actually a dip in our subscription camp, a dip in our subscription. So people were canceling. I think they were clearing shop and just clearing out any kind of reoccurring payments. And when we saw that we not only saw that people were losing their jobs, but it was actually impacting our customer base directly. So we sent out a communication from our personal emails that was saying, hey, we, we see you, we see the plight that you're going through and these are really scary, un, uh, challenging times. And we wanna do our small part to make it easier for you to get your rem remedy. Like here's a discount code for like half off for your next three months, just so that you can weather the storm together. And yeah. the number of responses that we saw to that initiative was, truly truly surprising um people had to it wasn't a discount code they had to actually respond to us directly and we were expecting what like a handful and it was i think it was like a 75 percent redemption rate on people coming back and saying thank you so much that really means a lot that you care so much about your customers and it's it's a you know i know that this is a testimony from my own brand but it's something that we're really proud of 100 percent. um we too similarly you know the pandemic was really hard on people to actually eat the way that they wanted to. So we made sure that first line workers, um, you know, underprivileged customers and other partnerships had the food that they needed. So we did many donations and making sure that we could just help the world eat more fruits and vegetables. So I know, you know, we did that really well. I think one thing also that's happened recently was LinkedIn just giving a week off to their entire company mm -hmm. to um, sort yeah. of combat burnout. That's right. just one tiny example of companies really stepping up and recognizing how do we make sure that our people are taken care of because the pandemic is a really interesting and unique context that you know, thus far we have not lived through. And so there's many learnings that need to be taken from that. Um, so I thought it was just a really interesting move uh, from from them. Definitely. Uh, and maybe just one final question that I think is kind of interesting, but for all the brands that you guys work on or have worked on, um, content has really been king in a really strong way uh, of kind of driving that so in kind of your own opinions how do brands really use their content to really authentically build that loyalty with their consumers uh and maybe alexa you can go first sure absolutely um we have multiple different pillars of content but i think one thing is that we always want to leave our customers feeling like they've learned something new and that they're empowered to make better decisions and we've made it easier for them to make better decision whether that's what you eat uh how you get it whatever it might be so really removing that friction um is just it's super important 
I love that. Kate, what about you? Yeah, for us, you know, our mission has always been to transform your relationship with food from day one. And we're now thinking about how we can actually intercept and engage with customers one level above and thinking about, you know, guiding them on educating them on how to make better nutritious and food behavior choices. So we're actually starting to dive into the space of nutrition coaching and personalized plans. Um, and then also offering a suite of remedy products so that they really truly have a, a, a best a vetted toolkit that they can pull from. Um, and I think that, you know, we think about content living also about where content lives. And I think that a lot of times it's living on a brand's website, but how do we make it easier for customers to get the content? So we will typically actually um, put them in very digestible, no pun intended, uh, captions of Instagram posts or stories so that it's really easy for people to get this information without having to go to another platform and search for it. Very cool. I'm just going to say very quickly, I think it goes back to right time, right place. You know, it's it's brands have to kind of get out of their own way, stop trying to control the experience and, you know, build for the platform, build for the consumer and the mindset that they're in. Awesome. Well, thank you guys again, you know, from, from the bottom of my heart, Alexa, Nikki, Kate, you guys have all made great impacts in my life. So thank you for joining me in my new space here with Matt, but deeply appreciate kind of your time here. I know you're all very busy. Yeah, thank you so much. This has been amazing. We'll have to do it again soon. Uh, I want to thank the audience for joining um, our 21st edition of Susie's State of the Consumer. Um, don't uh, Be sure not to miss next week's webinar on the future of snacking with Susie President uh, Avi Savar. Savar. We'll be posting about that on social media. And just really want to thank everyone for the continued support. So on behalf of me and Abel and our whole team at Susie and our amazing guests today, thank you and stay safe, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Rob.